I might welcome you again because I'm not sure if you heard me before. My name is Julie McCrossan and welcome to the Walpa Wellbeing Program, supporting older people in a time of crisis. The third in our series on uh, mental health in the time of COVID-19. And here I am, I do apologize, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just having a tiny bit of trouble with my video. And I think I'm live with you now, and so I hope I am, and it's very nice to see you. Um, so what I would uh, like to do again is welcome you to supporting older people in a time of crisis. Uh, the most important thing to say is we've got a fantastic panel and I want you to start sending your questions on how to support yourself and others in a time of crisis right now. You'll see on the bottom of your screen the Q&A function. We won't be using chat, we'll only be using Q&A and your questions are welcome. But it's my pleasure now to begin by welcoming the President of WALPA, Richard Glass. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Apologies for that little delay there. Thank you, Julie. Um, everyone has been affected in some way by this pandemic and our lives have been changed for the foreseeable future. It's expected that the psychological impacts will touch many more people than and will endure well beyond the physical and medical impacts of COVID-19. I'd like to take a moment just to say that I do fear, however, there is a growing sense of complacency, possibly because most people don't know anyone who has been badly affected by this virus. Sadly, I do. And I can tell you this illness is not trivial and it can have devastating effects. Whilst older people are most vulnerable to a poor outcome, there has been a globally significant increase in the number of younger people falling seriously ill and 25% to 40% of people diagnosed with coronavirus actually have no symptoms at all, but they are contagious. So I'm just taking a moment to urge you all, irrespective of your age, to adhere to the health guidelines to protect yourselves, your family and your friends. And please unashamedly expect the same of others. And grandparents, you do need to understand that as tempting as it is to cuddle the grandkids, it really and sad to say, is not a good idea. And there's certainly the risk that what is happening in Melbourne could happen in Sydney. So I do ask all to please not be complacent, particularly our older people. So once in a century event as this is, is extremely disturbing and it can precipitate feelings and behaviours alien to many individuals and their families. So we at WALPA want people to know that it is okay to ask for help we want them to know from where they can get that help. And we want them to know that they are not alone in wanting and perhaps needing support. So for that reason, our WAPA wellbeing team has curated a series of seminars to help those in our community better understand the mental health issues that may impact those that we love or those for whom we are responsible. In doing so, we've also chosen to partner with key community organisations as we believe it is essential that members of our community understand the extensive range of support that is available to them, in addition to those generally available. In this case, I'm delighted to say that this evening, we're partnering with COA and Montefiore, both wonderful organisations about which you'll hear more very soon. So I trust you will find this evening's discussion informative and of value. And at this point, I'd like to introduce our wellbeing convener and life member, Dr. Alan Schell. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Richard, and thank you everybody for uh, coming along tonight. We have well over 200 people that have registered or are watching us tonight. So I think that's certainly very, for us, very well supported. But on the other hand, we're here to support the community. For those that are new to the series, I've been involved with Walper and others over the past 15 years in the wellbeing sessions. While WAPA is a first in its class rehab and palliative care unit in the broader Eastern Suburbs community, offering outreach, physiotherapy, it also supports other community organisations, particularly those that are involved in supporting many of the other people in the community. And with that tonight, we have sponsored and are being partnered with COA. I think that it's important to understand that we're here to help this community, uh, we are 
a Jewish community organization, but we're here to support all of our community as best we can. And I think that as Richard has said, it's part of the third series um, of events that we're doing tonight. And I believe that uh, you'll find this very, very informative. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Rachel Tenney, who's the CEO of COA, for a brief introduction to that organization, which WARPA supports wholeheartedly. Thank you, Rachel. Thank you, Dr. Shell. And thank you so much to WARPA for having us as a partner for this seminar. It's always a pleasure to be able to work together with fellow JCA constituent organizations, and we appreciate the opportunity for collaboration. Now, just to introduce a little bit about COA and what we do, um, in addition to supporting seniors in the community generally, the first question that I always get is, what does COA stand for? And while COA is a name that stands on its own, we like to say that it stands for what we do, which is providing connections, opportunities, and activities for the seniors in our community. And the definition of what those services are, are our three core service areas. So in our connections provisions, we provide outreach services to the over 65 population including free social work assessments and reassessments, as well as grief and loneliness counseling. We provide transportation to and from our activity center directly to people's homes. We provide care matching. So um, if somebody needs assistance in the home, we will suggest a carer who might be a good fit for them. We also promote security in people's homes through silent sentinel security alarms, as well as free 10 year smoke alarms. And we have services to provide connections, social connections, such as Shalom Connect, where people can speak with a volunteer over the phone daily or weekly, Tech Connect, which is similar, but with video chats, T for Two, which in better times um, is a pairing of volunteers with a housebound senior who they can visit and share a cup of tea with. We also have a shopping project to help seniors get the foods and supplies that they need. And our Hannah Mayer project, which is the only project in Sydney that consistently facilitates candle lightings for Shabbat and holidays for Jewish residents of non-denominational nursing homes. We also have our opportunities, which is really, in a sense, our flagship program of food provision uh, because that gives seniors the opportunity to stay home and remain independent. Um, COA provides the only kosher Meals on Wheels service in all of New South Wales and the ACT, which enables seniors to stay connected to their culture and their religion and remain at home and independent longer. It also promotes food security and our services because they are subject to the Meals on Wheels nutrition requirements are all nutritionally balanced and specifically uh, detailed to meet seniors' nutritional needs. And finally, we provide activities, which has been somewhat stymied recently um, through our Krieger Activity Center in Willara, which in normal times is open six days a week on a drop-in basis, as well as providing bus outings and special events throughout the year, usually celebrating cultural or religious events and holidays. So in partnering with Wolper for this seminar series, the first thing that I noticed is the, the title of the program to support older people in a time of crisis. But of course, as Richard mentioned, this is a time where people need support. So that begs the question of, what makes this different? How is supporting older people different? And I think it really comes down to three things. So older people have different needs, different vulnerabilities, and different wants or different desires. So as you age, your needs for nutrition change, your need for assistance with certain daily tasks can change over time. And sometimes there are new financial challenges, especially as you move from the working world into retired semi -re or semi-retired. Then there are different vulnerabilities. So as we see with COVID-19 in particular, age and health, existing health problems are particular vulnerabilities for this particular crisis. 
But there are also other mental health issues such as loneliness that tend to compound as people age as they move away from the workplace social network that they used to have. And in many cases, as they lose a spouse or their children and grandchildren move farther away. But what's most important to me as CEO of COA is to look at the different wants that seniors have. I think this is what really sets us apart as a community and as an organization. We're not paternalistic. We are not just for seniors, we are by seniors. And if you ask yourself, what is it that the seniors want, it's going to possibly be a different answer than if you ask the seniors themselves what they want. So the key, in my view, from my extensive work with this community, is that you should promote that independence, that autonomy, and that self-determination that people have had their entire lives. Just because somebody is getting older doesn't mean that they lose that ability to make choices for themselves. And they have their own wants, and they're willing to express it if you're willing to listen. And the only caveat to that is you have to ask the question, but what about during a crisis? Because during a crisis, often we have to react. We don't have time to do that community consultation, which is why it's been very important to us to do that community consultation consistently so that when the crisis happens, we already understand our community, we know them well, and we have a good understanding of what it is that they actually want. So hopefully we're able to deliver on that. And so far the feedback we've gotten has been fantastic. Rachel, uh, it's Julie McCrossan here, the host. I, I wonder if I could ask you to wrap it up now because we've got a lot of uh, our audience waiting keenly to ask questions, but is there one more thing you'd like to say? Um, yeah, so I just wanted to um, highlight in one minute maybe um, COA's crisis response, which has been magnificent. We have completely converted our activity center to a food distribution center. We formed a corporate partnership with Harris Farm Markets to provide free fresh fruits and vegetables to seniors. And we've actually ramped up our meal provision so much that during one week in June of last year, we delivered 373 meals. And in that same week in 2020, we delivered 1,542 meals. So an enormous increase. Um, so yeah, thank you very much to Wolper for having us as a partner. Thank you so much, Rachel. And uh, if people could give her applause in this method, this is the uh, sign language for applause. And if you're watching at home or at uh, Walper Jewish Hospital, I'd uh, urge you to do so. And welcome again uh, to people watching us on Facebook. We're just about to go to the first of our polls to get the opinion of our audience on this question of just who is an older person. But uh, we've had some more people join us. So just a reminder to our audience, you are on mute and you are not on video. So you're invisible to us, but through the Q&A bot uh, button at the bottom of your screen, if you click on that, you can send questions. And Dr. Alan Shell, who we heard from a moment ago, will be watching those questions and I will come to him regularly uh, to get questions from the audience. Uh, the only other thing to say is that we may not be able to get to all of your questions, but we'll, we'll try very hard and we will be finishing uh, uh, at around 9 p.m. So ladies and gentlemen, up in the stratosphere is a man called Jackson and he's about to put up the first poll. This is called Supporting Older People in a Time of Crisis. Who are older people? And the first poll will appear on your screen asking the question, who do you think are older people? Over 50, over 60, over 65, over 70, over 80. And uh, only our panelists can't vote. I'm going to be quiet while you vote as quickly as you can. Who do you think are older? And Jackson is monitoring the speed of your answers and will, once he has a certain proportion of our growing audience, he will put the results up on the screen. Who do you think are older people? Well, Jackson, I can feel in my waters, it might be about time. And everybody there can see the results. 
uh, nearly 40% think over 80, roughly 40% think over 70, and 14% over 65. Only 7% over 60. So I'm just going to take that screen away now and it gives me great pleasure with that insight getting us thinking what it does it mean to be older is it about age or is it about retirement cognitive capacity frailty whether you're falling over or whether you need a mobility aid let me introduce uh, the first uh, panel members professor henry badati ao professor of aging and mental health at the University of New South Wales. I'll tell you more when I come to him in a moment. Professor Richard Bryant, AC, the Scientia Professor of Psychology at the University of New South Wales and also leader of the University of New South Wales and Westmead Trauma Stress Clinic. And Melissa Levi, clinical psychologist at St Vincent's Hospital. Welcome uh, to all of you. Professor Bryant, can I come to you? I'm interested in uh, your perspective on the title. First of all, what do you think of as older people? And I need to warn you that some members of the uh, panel qualify for the services of COA. And as someone who studies trauma, is this a time of crisis? Welcome to you, uh, to Professor Bryant. Thanks, Julie. Well, as somebody who turns 60 in a few weeks, I am definitely going to say that it's definitely not over 50. Um, Look, it's a very subjective thing what older is. Um, honestly, some people in their 50s feel they're old and some people in their 80s do not feel they're old. And I think it depends on so many individual factors. It depends on your physical health. It depends on your social environment. There are so many factors that impact on this thing that we call old. Um, in terms of, are we in a mental health crisis? Um, there's been so much written and talked about over the last couple of months around the world about this. I'll make a couple of points. First of all, I think a lot of the predictions that we're going to have a tsunami of mental health disorders, I personally don't buy into that. We know from all previous major events, uh, we know from previous pandemics, and in fact, the early work coming out of COVID-19 is that we are gonna get a significant increase in mental health problems in people, but most people are going to cope. Most people have got social networks, they've got family, they've got resources that they can draw on to help them cope. Now, I think it's fair to say that most of us won't cope as well as we were coping. I certainly count myself in that group. I think it's, it's been tough. In what way for you, sir? There's just been a lot of strain, I think, in terms of a lot of the things that I would normally do, getting out, doing the things that give me release, um, seeing people socially, I can't do it. Um, in terms of the people I work with, my own teams, what I'm finding a lot is that many people cope very well to begin with, but as now their time is really clicking on, and we're like into month number three or four of this um, process, it's like our resources are just getting drained. And I think we know from it's, it's normal um, psychology that we have a, a pool of resources, if you like, but if we, that pool constantly gets drained and we're not allowed to replace it with other things, it just is harder and harder for us to cope. And in a sense, I think what's happened in COVID for all of us, but particularly those for, who are at risk, is a lot of the negatives and a lot of the demands have just been constantly increasing. But at the very same time, all the positive things that we often have that help us cope with these things normally have actually been diminished. Can you give me an example of what's been diminished? Friends, social contact, um, physical uh, activity, um, the things that, that we would normally do. I mean, probably if we look at all around the world, the studies that have been done so far in, in Europe and in China with COVID, one of the biggest predictors of people not coping is just loneliness. 
And it's because I, I cannot tell you how much I bore you with how much research has been done at all sorts of levels about how we need each other. We need social interactions to maintain good mental health. Take that away from people. It affects how our brains work. It affects how we deal with threat, pain, stress. It, it's, it's, there are hundreds of studies telling us this, and this is the one thing I think that's impacting on so many of us, and it's wearing us down. Richard, I, I want to ask you uh, uh, two more questions, if I may, and then we'll go to our first uh, audience questions. And uh, while our audience is very clear with us, they like to have uh, practical strategies about how to manage these dilemmas. I do want to just explore the dilemma a little bit longer with you. Because you work in the trauma stress clinic, you're clearly an expert on trauma and stress. And it strikes me that with the audience we have with Walpa Jewish Hospital, we will have people watching who will still have parents who are survivors of the Holocaust or who themselves may be experiencing the stress of the, the next generation. And I, I, the other element too is that because we're talking about older people, the, and many of the Walper audience have big international connections, there is ambiguity about when we will be able to travel again to other countries, or indeed when our children or grandchildren will be able to travel to us. Could you just comment on those two particular causes that I think of distress that are specific to this audience and what can assist them? Sure, two great points. Look, I, I think what's one of the things that's happened in COVID is that because we haven't been able to get out and just do the things we normally do. We're stuck at home, we're socially isolated. It means we don't have the, the normal distractions that keep us busy. Now, what we're noticing a lot at the moment is that just being on our own and being within our own four walls, inevitably what's happening is things from the past tend to be becoming more prominent. Um, it can be memories of childhood, it can be memories of previous stresses in life, um, the second generation um, people of, of the Holocaust or, or other events, um, these things can come into play more. And why? Because how we managed all those things previously, those strategies, if you like, even though we didn't intentionally engage in them, have been uh, eroded. And that means that these things just pop into our minds, we worry about it, we ruminate about it, and that becomes more and more of a problem. And what we know in older people in particular is that the way our brains work is that there are certain parts of the brain that help us regulate and, and manage these things well. But as we get older, sometimes those parts of the brain don't work as efficiently, particularly when there's some cognitive decline. And when we start to be socially isolated, it's like the ways we would normally deal with that including just phys basic physical activity, then we aren't able to engage in those strategies, which means, again, the way we have to regulate things and, and, and just manage them is, is diminished. And so we have to deal with those things better. A couple of strategies, a couple of, you know, let's go to yep. some solutions. What, should we be moving up and down our back verandas? Should we be digging in the garden? Like, what, what strategies can people use? Well, I think absolutely what you just suggested. I think some of the key ones are, as difficult as it is, we must maintain our social support. And this is as much a message to older people as to the younger people who are their support people. You know, their, their children, their grandchildren, their friends. But we should not be getting complacent as time goes on. And I know we often are talking about complacency in the sense of transmission at the moment, but I think we can also become complacent about looking out for each other. And I think we really need to be making an effort about calling people. Um, and it's difficult for older people to engage in um, video conferencing and social media. It's, it's not their second nature. It's not how they've traditionally interacted with, with their friends and family. But it's important that people are constantly uh, reaching out to people. Because if I'm stuck at home, and it, but if I've got people talking to me you know, three times a day, and it's, it's, a, it's a quality interaction, that, that does a world of good. 
and even writing a letter or anything like that can be useful from the grandkids sending a, a drawing that they've done at school. Um, and also the physical activity is, is incredibly important. And, and it's also a matter of just doing good, positive things for yourself. And what we find at times like this is that it's when it's very easy to stop getting involved in pleasure. And we, we do lose that capacity. And you've got to think, okay, life is putting more negatives on me at the moment because of this, this virus. Well, I need to compensate for that. And I need to put more positives back in my life. So maybe I need to do things I normally would not do, despite all the limitations. And it could be anything and everybody's different. It might just be a bubble bath. It might be, um, you know, dr drinking that, that special red. Um, it, could be, it could be anything, um, but treat yourself. And I think doing that and maintaining physical activity, those things are really going to help us ward off some of the problems. Look, thank you so much, Professor Richard Bright. Obviously, we're going to come back to you, but I might ask our question moderator, Dr. Alan Schell, uh, do we have an audience question you'd like to bring to us? Well, Richard answered a couple there in a way. How do I support an elderly parent who's struggling with anxiety due to COVID and is living in a different country from me? And then the second part of that was, what exercise should an older person be doing? Is um, the two questions actually that you partly answered. Look, what I might the do- The issue is really about, and the same for us, where we have a child in another country with grandchildren, and uh, we'd like to keep in touch. So we keep in touch on FaceTime, but is that enough? And so some of the things you then discussed uh, with regard to emotional attachment, doing things that are good for yourself. But again, you know, having something on FaceTime has been a bonus, there's no argument. So I guess struggling with anxiety during this because of separation and what exercises could people be doing? What I might do if I may is introduce Professor Henry Badati, uh, AO Professor of Aging and Mental Health at the University of New South Wales and also the Montefiore Chair of Healthy Brain Aging and the Director of Demen the Dementia Centre for Research Collaboration. Welcome to you, Henry. I know you have many, many years of uh, uh, contact uh, and, and supporting older people. I'd love you to answer Alan's questions, but also wh who do you think is older? Because I think Richard Bryan skated away from that question and I think you might qualify for COA services as, as well as me. Welcome. Uh, uh, Julie, uh, thank you very much. Uh, older is 10 years older than I am. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever age I am. So that's the way it goes. I, I noticed one person replied in the audience, um, over 50, and I bet you that person was well under 50 who said that. So when we're 20, 50 looks old. But when we're 70, 70 doesn't look old at all. 80 is starting to look old, and 90 is definitely old. But when I'm 80, maybe 80 won't look so old either. Could I say one quick thing about that, and then we'll get back to the questions the audience have asked. It's just that, uh, as some people know, I had a stage four cancer seven years ago uh, and brutal radiation and chemo, which kept me alive. I'm forever grateful for it. But my point is that in my recovery period, I fell over three times walking a small cavoodle. I experienced um, many of the issues, both emotionally and psychologically and physically, that I'd observed my uh, late elderly mother. I experienced frailty. I experienced yeah. cognitive decline. I experienced memory loss, but falling over three times, that was amazing. Now, I've come back. I don't think to my belly button age. So I guess my point is, it isn't necessarily linear, is it? That's it absolutely right. It make you get yeah. older. Over yeah. to you, yeah. Yeah, no, you're quite right, Julie. And um, when you're sick, you certainly feel older and frailer and more vulnerable. Uh, but you can bounce back as you obviously have, you full of beans, yeah. So is that true on the, so addressing this question of what people can do to manage separation from family overseas, the distress yes. of that with ambiguity about when that will change. We're like refugees in a cab. We don't know when we're gonna get out. That's right. And um, w luckily we have uh, technology now we didn't have a generation ago, which allows people to, to keep in touch and I know Alan keeps in touch with his grandchildren by FaceTime. Uh, he's got family in Israel. And, uh, and a lot of us uh, who have that uh, 
that makes the way of connection. Uh, we don't have to make the reverse charges calls that we used to make uh, a generation ago to be able to do that. Um, the, um, the ways to cope with the anxiety and depression, I mean, I agree completely with Richard, the importance of social contacts and the importance of physical exercise um, I know that there was a survey in the States, like 40% of older people feel lonely and about a quarter of them feel socially isolated. And this is going to be a lot worse with COVID. But a lot of it depends on personality. You know, there are letters to the editor of the Herald. My husband's always been introvert. He's loving this social distancing. And, um, you know, I've been working at home for the last three months and uh, I'm a bit like that myself. And I've actually found it quite nice. Uh, having more time to uh, do my exercise in the morning. Uh, I can have enough social interaction through these Zooms and other media. Um, but now it's month four. You know, it's wearing, starting to affect now. But generally, for a lot of people, it's not always been a negative thing. And luckily for older people, we're not out there, most of us, trying to find a job. So we're protected from the economic crisis that's really besetting the country and going to get worse over the next few months. And, and you're obviously an expert on dementia and, uh, and your work has taken you for uh, many years into residential aged care. And uh, we want to turn to that in a moment when I bring uh, Melissa Levi in uh, from St Vincent's. Um, but are there particular issues for people with dementia or people caring and supporting people with dementia in the context of COVID-19? Oh, there are heaps of issues, Julie. Uh, first of all, someone with dementia may not understand what's happening around them. They may not understand why they can't see the people they love. They can't understand why they're being isolated in their rooms and not being allowed to do the activities they did before. Um, they may be physically isolated and many nursing homes have very strict uh, regimens for visitors that completely barring them or making them very limited uh, contacts. Sometimes the relatives were more distressed than the people with dementia about not being able to see them as well. Um, there's also the issue about not seeing your doctors. So doctors weren't coming to see patients, uh, medical conditions weren't, weren't being uh, treated, dental conditions weren't being treated. Uh, dental work was a particular risk because of the, uh, the spray that comes out when people are using the dentists are using their high speed uh, drills. Um, so medical conditions are being neglected. Uh, we're going to see probably an increase in later stages of illness that should have been picked up earlier. Um, <clears throat> and is that access to care, dentistry and medical care in, in residential aged care or generally improving, do you know? Just in the last couple of weeks, I think there's been a relaxation, yeah. Um, I just want to say about how people can cope with the depression and anxiety, and I, I know others are going to talk about that, but there are lots of resources out there. There's an older Australian hotline that's been set up. That's 1-800-171-866. 1-800-171-866, that's specifically for older people. Uh, at St Vincent's, um, there is the This Way Up program, which is for depression and anxiety. And they were offering free online treatments for people with depression and anxiety. There are many packages out there that World Health Organization, if you typed in World Health Organization COVID, you'd find there's a whole package of recommendations. The Australian Psychological Society, which we might hear about soon, has a number of recommendations too. So there's lots of support out there. We've heard from the COA. They providing uh, counselling services. Um, you know, we're all in this together. That's become a bit of a cliche, but you are not alone. Even when we're isolated, we're all connected. It's just a matter of reaching out. And us as a community, our job is to reach in and make sure that the older person we care about has got food, has got medications, has got access to the care they need. Uh, a lot of carers were not going to people's homes because they were frightened of giving or catching COVID. It, it strikes me that digital literacy is a critical issue right now because a lot of the help you've, you've suggested there goes to what we're doing now. Yes. Uh, and uh, it, uh, it's almost like we could add to that list of what we can do for others 
find someone who doesn't understand how to link via Zoom or do the basic computer. This is a time for older people, however we define it, to get digital skills. But can I just ask you about loneliness? You began with that astonishing figure of 40%, I think you said, of older people. What, what age are they talking about there? And what is it? Is loneliness in, intrinsic to ageing? Like, is it going to happen to me? It hasn't happened yet. Or is it just a product of loss of physical mobility? Why is it so high? Well, it's physical mobility. It's often sensory loss. So if you can't hear people or you can't see people, about 30% of older people will have problems with hearing. 30% will develop problems with vision, such as the senile maculopathy, which is common, the glaucoma. Um, so you become isolated. If you can't see and hear people, that's a huge issue. For, for anyone, regardless of age, but it's just more common with, with, with age. Uh, people become less, um, they move around less. We're, we've been involved in studies where we just measure the radius of a people's, person's movements over a week. And as you get older, it does shrink. And if people with dementia, it shrinks even more. And if in a nursing home, even more. And could I ask you, Henry, uh, and also uh, uh, Richard, Bryant, is there any research yet on whether this, what we're doing now, Zoom connection, which is, to, I'd never Zoomed until about a month ago, and I'm not forever Zooming. Um, is this, how, how good is this at human connection, at meeting that core human need? Do we know yet? Uh, I, there is some research, uh, Richard will know more than me, but it's not a total substitute. You know, as you know, Seeing someone face to face is a different quality, and being able to hold them. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, Alan mentioned grandchildren. I haven't hugged my grandchildren for three months, and I really miss it. Yeah. Yeah, and and that's uh, you know we know with elderly parents sometimes just sitting quietly and holding someone's hand is a big. It's a very nice thing mutually, isn't it? And a lot of people talk about touch hunger for older people. They don't have anyone who actually gives them a hug. And it's even worse now. Uh, Professor Bryant, that issue of uh, the quality of this interaction and how it addresses people's loneliness and need for contact. I mean, Henry's absolutely correct. Um, I mean, it reminds me of some old studies that were done back in the 50s, where you know people were looking at its, its social attachments. And this is actually done in monkeys. And believe it or not, now I'm not getting off the topic, um, so stay with me. Um, they, they had these little monkeys and they, were, they had monkeys that were sort of fake monkeys. Some of them were just wire monkeys, but they gave milk. They could eat of them. Other monkeys that were fake monkeys, they were made of cloth, but they didn't give them any food. Study after study after study found that the baby monkeys always went to the cloth monkey because it gave them um, touch comfort. Wow. And this is a cross-species thing we have with our caregivers. And then as we grow older with other people, Zoom and all the rest of it's great, but it is good. It's even better. We do need physical contact. And to be honest, though, we have limitations because of government rules, because of government advice about distancing. And there's also going to be a fair few of us who are just anxious about either getting infected or transmitting to you know, vulnerable people. And so we stay away from people. And that's a, that is a, a cost of this. No one talks about it much, but it's, it's a huge cost. I'll come to you, Alan Shell, for a question in just a moment, but I just want to ask um, Richard Bryant, is there any research on pets? I have to reveal to you, I'm known as someone utterly obsessed with dogs and they've been a comfort to me since a very early age. But it, it strikes me, we until we get a vaccine, we're going to have a prolonged sensitivity around touch. And if it's so fundamental a human need, how are we going to get warm mammalian contact? There's not limited research on it, but as someone who, to be honest, my main coping mechanism through COVID has been my border collie. And I like to think I've been her main coping mechanism. Um, but there is work that we, are, we have all sorts of attachment figures. Pets are really important ones because, I mean, 
they've got personality and they do actually give us that, that capacity. But I do want to emphasize that, I think this is relevant to um, our audience tonight, that it's not just that. There's a lot of work that tells us that even um, within uh, religious um, faith, um, God, uh, you know, can be a very important attachment figure. And I know there's been work done in Israel from friends of mine, and they found that as a way of coping with major threats, for, so for example, many of the, uh, the, the war that Israel's gone through, it's actually been through um, engagement with, with God, not necessarily the synagogue and interpersonal contact, but more with that um, faith that they have. In, in, in one sense, that is a, a great sense of closeness and togetherness. Yeah. And that's actually helped people cope enormously. Thank you. Alan Shell, Dr. Shell, are there other questions you'd like to bring to the table? Well, there's always in discussion, some of the answers have been provided, but one very good comment was we talked about digital literacy, but we know that there's an inherent fear of elderly people, older people towards the new digital age. So that is sort of a bit of an issue uh, that we can't quite overcome. Maybe you've got some strategies. And the other one is regarding the anxiety, therefore loss of sleep. And further to that one is what sort of medications for your anxiety, depression, um, should we be talking about besides the medicines and the non-medicine approach? So they're big questions, but I think part of this evening is to look at some of those issues. You know, I'm losing sleep, I'm anxious, and I'm getting a bit distressed maybe, more than depressed. But then again, are there some medicines I should be asking for and or what are the non-medicine ones I should be contemplating? Could I ask Henry and Richard to hold on to sleep and medication for me? And I want to first go to Melissa Levi, the clinical psychologist at St Vincent's Hospital and welcome her and, and go to this question of digital literacy because I know that uh, uh, she's working with older people in a, in a variety of ways and looking at how uh, help can be provided both in terms of physical health, mental health and also care. So welcome to you, Melissa, and your observations on, on digital literacy, because I think there's mixed research. I, see, I, think, uh, I mean, I'm 65, nearly 66. As I understand it, we're, my, my type of woman is massive users of Facebook, uh, less common on Instagram. But welcome to Melissa. Thank you so much, Julie. I'm really thrilled to be here and to join you all. Um, I, look, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I think when it comes to digital literacy, it is a bit of a, a mixed bag. Um, so I reflect on my own grandparents. Um, and in fact, I've got a, a grandmother-in-law on the line tonight who is 91 and Zooms and Facebooks and WhatsApps and um, and Similarly, I also had grandparents who were very fearful of technology and at one point there was a virus going around, a computer virus, and I remember we got a call at about 10 o'clock at night and it was my grandpa calling to say, you know, keep everyone away from the computer, I don't want them to catch a virus. Um, so you've got this real sort of array of, um, of technological literacy and I think while people, of course, you know, are entitled to, to find their comfort level and make the decisions that are right for them, I do think that those with technological literacy have, have probably fared a bit better during this time. Um, and it's probably highlighted also, I think, an opportunity for us to provide more technological support and training to older people, because it's not always a lack of desire. Um, often it's a lack of um, access to education, um, assistance, and, and so on. I know that um, just briefly in terms of if there are people that want to learn a bit more about technology, Telstra were offering a whole series of savvy learning courses for older people. Um, and the Australian government also had a Be Connected initiative. Um, and they offer technology training at all different levels. And, you know, I'm, in terms of what we can all do for each other, just checking that the older people in your life know how to use FaceTime. And I think, because it, obviously Steve, the late Steve Jobs has tried to help us with this to make it as user-friendly as possible. But, um, but also, I think going back to the remarks, I think, made by Professor Bradati, 
things like checking people's hearing aids uh, and glasses can be fundamental to using a phone. Uh, you know what I'm saying, don't you? So sometimes it comes back to those basics. But, but just before we come to the, the sleep and the medication issue, which I've got hanging in midair, uh, tell us about the help you're offering at St Vincent's for people. What, what, what are services available in St Vincent's? So Julie, I'm really glad that you touched on this because I think, um, funnily enough, I was having a conversation with a social work colleague earlier today um, and she had been sitting on another panel around sort of COVID and resources um, and there were all these different clinicians and service providers and somebody asked the question, you know, there are so many fabulous initiatives, how do I access you? So I'll tell you a bit about what we're doing at St. Vincent's and then I might also just give the audience members um, a couple of ports of call that they can reach out to in terms of how they can access support. And this really speaks to the question that was posed around how do we support older loved ones with depression, anxiety, possibly um, some post-traumatic stress style symptoms that have been triggered by COVID. Um, so at St Vincent's, I'm part of the Older People's Mental Health Service. During this time, we have offered teleconferencing and telehealth consults to people in their homes, in residential aged care. Um, and when it's been deemed necessary, so if somebody's symptoms are quite significant, it's causing them a lot of distress, we will go and see them in person using appropriate social distancing and personal protective um, gear. Um, and basically we offer um, consults with, and I'll let Professor Bradati speak to this, um, with a psychiatrist who specializes in old age and to that point on medication and sleep, you know, that um, person is often best poised to address that. We've also got clinical psychologists like myself to offer talking therapy, social workers to get people connected with care services and so on. So if you're, if you're sort of hearing this and thinking, you know, myself or my loved one would probably benefit from linking in with a team like this and there's a similar team at Prince of Wales which is led by Professor Bradati and um, RPA, all different hospitals, um, there is a mental health line for New South Wales, um, which is 1800 011 511. That's 1800 011 511. And they'll let you know based on your location, which is the nearest service. Um, it's also helpful to reach out to your GP. Um, some GPs are now offering in-person consults, but certainly even just picking up the phone and having a chat through the things that are concerning you, they can then direct you. Um, and also in terms of just that issue around care, one of the biggest things that I found, um, and I think possibly Professor Bryant touched on this, was around you know, families becoming quite distressed in terms of towing the line between wanting to support an older loved one, but also wanting and reaching out to some community centres. So whether it's COA, who I know are partners with WALPA, Jewish Care, um, we work quite closely with Holdsworth Community Centre. Um, and something that's been quite beautiful during this time is that a lot of the traditional barriers to these sorts of services, so, you know, possibly people coming into the home to help with cooking, cleaning, meals, personal care, or even just some social support, um, they've been removed because of COVID. So needing things like a GP referral or my age care pre-approvals, um, a lot of services have said, look, we're going to waive that um, and just get people the assistance that they need. Look, thank you, Melissa. And I'll come back to you later because you've got some interesting thoughts about how COVID-19 is affecting our attitudes and feelings about residential aged care. Mm. And just before I do that, if I could come to you, uh, Professor Henry Badati, on this question of, of sleep and medication and anything you'd add about accessing services, please. So uh, medication is usually not a good idea. Uh, except as a last resort. And so all the psychological strategies that Melissa talked about and accessing uh, talking services or community services or social socialization 
uh, or physical activity has got a great antidepressant effect in itself. All of those things should be tried and also helps with sleep. Uh, the issue with medication is, particularly with older people, there are more side effects. Um, and sometimes the side effects can be dangerous, like increasing the risk of falls, which you mentioned earlier. Uh, can people make people more confused? Some can make people quite constipated, which can be quite debilitating in itself. However, if the depression or anxiety is so bad that none of these strategies is working, then certainly um, it, should, it can be considered and starting at a very low dose and increasing slowly. Now that can happen through your GP or uh, if, the, if the GP uh, refers you to a specialist mental health service or for many mental health services, you can go directly yourself if, if, if you're affected in that way. And so, as Melissa said, a lot of the barriers or requirements have been waived now. And it's possible to get your consultation online. And if you don't have the facility or you don't have a computer, I've got patients who don't even have a computer at home, mm -hmm. let alone know how to use it. Um, ask the youngest person you know to help you. And that usually works. Or your neighbor might be able to help with loaning your com their computer and help you with that. And, and Henry, um attitudes to going to a service that is obviously about mental health is that better these days I, 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 I'm not still don't know if we've defined older it's 10 years older than you how old are you do you mind me asking well um, I'll be uh, 73 in about uh, three days time yeah okay so oh, well happy birthday so Thank older you. is in fact 83 or more yeah. but, I mean, are, are attitudes about the stigma of mental health are they getting better there's a stigma with aging. Um, so um, I think even Richard said, uh, I don't consider myself old yet. I'm be 60 and you know, like it's, it's a bad thing to be old. It's not a bad thing to be old. It's, it's <laughs> as they say, much better than the alternative. Yes. Um, so there's a stigma with aging and there's certainly a stigma with mental illness. I think it's getting less. We're seeing many more public figures coming out and talking about their depression. You know, uh, football stars, uh, people in the, in, the, in the entertainment industry, it's become politicians. Uh, Jeff Gallup talked about his anxiety and depression. I remember he was uh, Premier of, New, of Western Australia. So I, it's becoming okay. There are these programs like Are You Okay? Which was a, a national program. If you're worried about someone, just ask them, are you okay? Talk to them, give people permission to talk to you about those things. Look, thank you. And uh, Professor Bryant, your thoughts on medication and sleep? Well, I'd definitely defer to, to Henry on the medication. And I absolutely agree with, with what he just said. Um, in terms of the sleep, uh, there are some very good strategies. And if people are a bit reluctant to, to go and see somebody, there are certain um, resources that you can access very easily. And I would recommend people to the Black Dog Institute. Um, they have an excellent website. And you can actually do a very simple self-assessment. And I know they've got a very good um, online um, program for insomnia, for example. And so something like that can be very, very helpful. Um, there are, I think one of the things to be aware of is that as we go forward in the next few years, and we do need to be thinking about that time span not just the next few months. Um, I think we just need to be aware that don't just equate uh, seeking help for when I have a, a mental disorder, because I think a lot of people are gonna have mental health issues and they may not actually be a disorder. Um, so a lot of people are gonna be facing unemployment or underemployment. And I think for a lot of older people, there's gonna be issues, for example, my retirement fund is going to be hit because dividends are down because of the stock market. Or my retirement might rely on in rent coming in from investment properties. But all of that's now been sort of reduced. There might be vacancies for maybe a whole year. And so where, where is my income coming from? Mm. Now, when there's a, a financial stress like that, I mean, that's a huge hit on how we cope and it's an understandable strain. And people will often think, well, it's under, you know, I'm under stress, I've just got to deal with it. Um, because a lot of these people 
they're not, they don't, they don't see themselves as like, I'm not somebody who has a mental health issue. And I guess my message to them is don't necessarily label yourself as having a mental health disorder or problem. We're all going through an incredibly unusual, unique time. We've got unforeseen stresses on us, but there are still great strategies out there to help us cope with things like, I can't sleep, I'm getting really irritable, I might be drinking more than I should, um, I just might be on edge, my partner might be telling me I'm, I'm really cranky. These are just telltale signs. And I think if you're not familiar with going online, do talk to your GP or encourage someone else to talk to your GP. And most GPs, they know how to connect you to people who can help. And, and Richard, I'm glad you mentioned the alcohol issue because as, as many people are probably experiencing it, I, I am constantly bombarded through my various social media outlets with ads for clean skin wines, which appear to be cheaper than mineral water and can be delivered uh, 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 quickly. And uh, my understanding just from media coverage is that there's, uh, where there is a growth in terms of jobs at the moment is people to deliver alcohol to people's homes. And uh, just any comments there on the alcohol issue and the older person, because I understand that older people are an at-risk group, and this is an at-risk moment. Yes. Well, first of all, Julie, I'm, I'm concerned that your Google search is actually targeting you for more alcohol advertising, um, but, but we won't go there. Um, but, uh, I mean, there's a lot of data already coming out that alcohol sales, obviously, are, are definitely up. Drug and alcohol um, services are definitely noticing, you know, worse... Um, patterns that are occurring. And we've seen this before in pandemic and in economic downturn. But of course, that leads to a whole bunch of problems, you know, secondary mental health problems and domestic violence and, and things like this. Um, so what's your advice to someone listening who's a bit worried? They think they have hit it a bit hard and they're anxious. Yes, and I, well, I think there's a few things. I, I think, again, it's the, the drinking too much or using other substances too much it's another sign that maybe I'm not coping as well as I should, and maybe I need to learn how to deal with it. And again, there's very good um, online services that, that one can access for this. I think if one goes and sees most GPs, they can give you good, put you in touch with people who can, who can help. I would emphasize, I don't think people should judge themselves harshly. Like I'm, you know, I'm a, doing the wrong thing, I'm a bad person, something like that, because it's, an under, it's a coping mechanism. Mm. And some people will use drinking, some people use other things. We have to cope. But the problem with alcohol and other things like this is that it actually can create anxiety, worsen anxiety. So for example, we know that alcohol, a lot of people drink at night to, to, to relax themselves, to help themselves sleep. It's actually the worst thing to do because alcohol is a stimulant. And after a few hours, it's actually going to cause you to wake up and interfere with your sleep. And lots of people aren't even aware of that. So I think just getting basic education too can help people work out, how do I handle this? Yes, Melissa, I can feel you. I, just, I, I really wanted to pick up on Professor Bryant's point around this idea of, um, you know, a lot of the clients that we see come to us when symptoms have really become quite severe. Um, and either it's really interfered with their functioning or a loved one has become quite concerned and facilitated the referral. Um, but I, I really, it resonated with me a lot, Professor Bryant, when you said this idea that it doesn't need to be a disorder to reach out for quote unquote mental health support. And I think older, the older population, there have been studies that show that there's a huge proportion of people that while they don't meet clinical criteria for, for example, depression, anxiety, substance misuse, they're still suffering significantly from subclinical symptoms. Um, and I think to Professor Bradati's point around, you know, where does medication have a role? Um, I do think that the first step is often looking at that talking therapy and 
we're not going to get you to lie on a leather, you know, lounge and tell us your dreams. And, you know, I think we've come a long way in terms of our practice in psychology. Often the treatments are relatively short term. They're very evidence based. They're skills based. There's good, good gold standard research behind them. So I think if you or, a lo or for a loved one would like to access some talking therapy, um, often go to your GP. Um, they can refer you possibly privately. There are also government subsidies to help with the cost through the mental health care plan. And otherwise, you're welcome to come to a service like ours at a, um, a hospital where, which specializes in older people's mental health or Professor Bradati's service has clinical psychologists. Um, and you can, again, always call that mental health line and they will sort of <laughs> be your guides in getting you connected. And can I just say, Melissa, um, you know, our, our title tonight is Supporting Older People in a Time of Crisis. And I want to turn to this question of your reflections on how this COVID-19 period has affected people's feelings and attitudes to aged care. And I have someone from Montefiore I can bring in in a moment as well. So what do you think are some of the challenges and concerns that stirred up? But also, if you could give me two or three concise examples where you think people are managing the crisis well and enriching people, please. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Julie. Um, so I think, you know, it's been really interesting because a lot of the conversations that I'm having both professionally, but also just personally with family, friends, um, is, you know, that COVID has shone this light on the fact that, you know, there's this sense of social isolation or loneliness or that perhaps there's not always um, sufficient staff available in residential care. And I think while COVID has highlighted it, um, I think, Julie, these are, are longer standing bigger picture sort of systemic issues. Um, and I think if we can take a silver lining from COVID, and I, I use that, that phrase a bit reluctantly because I know so many people have suffered significantly because of this, this time, I don't wish to minimize that. Um, but I do think a silver lining is that some of the, the issues that have been um, problematic for some time are now in the spotlight. And the beauty of that is that it is encouraging innovation and creativity in terms of how can we respond to this? How can we enrich quality of life in the community, in residential care? And I can give you um, a few examples, Julie, of, of what I've seen. So particularly in residential care, um, a lot of facilities have put on additional staff, not only to assist with traditional care in terms of physical care or medications, or, but also in terms of care of heart and care of mind. So to provide additional social interaction. Um, one facility in particular that I'm thinking of has their iPad patrol. So they have staff whose role and whether they're clinical staff or office staff that are volunteers go around with an iPad to facilitate Zoom calls with family and friends. Um, one facility has really um, decided to engage their residents. And I think this speaks to what Professor Bryant was saying earlier about meaningful activity. You know, what we do affects the way we feel. And age does not negate our need for a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning, contribution. So one facility that I work with quite closely, um, if you ring, you will most likely have the reception phone answered by a resident. Um, the residents are also helping with whatever interests them, morning tea, it could be folding laundry, um, it could be one resident's curating an art wall that gets changed every month. Um, so I think, uh, I'm just thinking, you know, uh, a client of mine used to be a French teacher in high school. And they now have her teaching small groups of French um, at her residential care facility. So I, I think what has come out of this is really just this idea that this need for social connectedness and for a sense of, of meaning um, has, has really become, become highlighted. And, and I, I think a lot of good will come from this. I really do. 
I have a, a close friend living in London and her 98 year old father is in, in a residential aged care in Sydney and she is benefiting from those organised iPad linkages that you're describing. Uh, I guess the other thing I want to just raise and get a response from you about is that there has been media coverage through the Royal Commission through Four Corners and that um, incredibly challenging situation with the, I think it's New March House, correct me if I'm wrong, but the Anglican place that had a major outbreak and there, that constant media images of family uh, uh, locked out by the gates and then mm. I know that some of that has been resolved and contact has been made but still a significant death rate. So why do I raise this rather un this very, very unhappy matter. Well, I'm just thinking if you happen to be a family who at this moment is facing the issue of does my elderly parent need residential aged care, it could be a very difficult time to make that decision. And, and as we've indicated, COVID-19, we may not have a, a vaccine for a year, year and a half, two years, if ever. So you're, are you getting any sense of that from families? Absolutely, absolutely. And we actually um, had a client the other week who needed emergency residential respite. And it was in the context of these current restrictions, um, you know, with limited visitations and this and that. And it, it, was, it was quite a difficult time because you're expecting somebody to adjust to a new environment and a new way of living. Um, and as Professor Bryant alluded to, without the traditional coping mechanisms or support network that would surround them for that transition. I think one of the, the biggest challenges that I found um, in terms of that residential residential aged care issue is also around dignity of risk. So I reflect on my own grandmother-in-law who at the beginning of COVID, um, you know, abided by the social distancing and, you know, wasn't sort of seeing any of us. And after a period of time, and she has the capacity, thankfully, to make in, an informed decision, felt that in fact, um, no, she would rather see her family at, at a distance um, than, you know, than, than, than not. Um, and she was in her own home, so she could make that decision for herself. One of the, the most challenging things that I found is that in residential age care, I have residents wanting to make that same decision um, and wanting to take that risk. But of course, you're not making that decision only for yourself. You're making it for others. Um, so that, that has been one particular challenge um, that's been really difficult. And there have been webinars, I know, of collectives of... Um... Uh, groups of people who represent both service providers and one might say the rights of elderly people are discussing whether some uh, homes have perhaps gone further than even the government recommendations and there's sort of human rights issues there. But look, I, I'd like to bring in Melanie Lindenberg, the Director of Client and Community Relations at Monte Fiore. Uh, and uh, I, I think people have been contacting Monte Fiore and, and no doubt you, Melanie, raising issues about the need for respite or residential age care. Can you give us a sense of what you're hearing from families and older people yourselves? Welcome to Melanie. Thank you. And thank you for having me here this evening, Julie. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, it's a little bit different to our, our usual times where we have the uh, lower care resident who comes in sometimes driving, but independently mobile, making a choice to come to aged care um, often because they're socially isolated or otherwise just because this is the place they'd like to be at this time of their lives. But as uh, Melissa and Richard touched on, those people are less likely to come in right now because of access externally. So until today, coincidentally today was the day that we lifted a lot of our visiting restrictions, um, people weren't able to go out and receiving visitors was, was by appointment. Today, that's changed a bit. So for the past couple of months, we've actually received mostly much higher care residents or residents who are palliating. And that's because they almost couldn't really go home. And I think, Melissa, you'll agree with, with this, that um, they probably reached the point of returning to hospital multiple times or have comorbids that would render them unable to, to return to their, their original home. Having and how have the families been coping? Uh, you, you know, uh, um, 
with not being able to visit because you know we've we've given such a broad definition to older many of our viewers tonight may well be visiting i used to visit someone who was well over 100 at your at montefiore you have a number of people over 100 so there could be people in their 80s watching this who are who found that block on visiting hard so how have you managed that and helped the families cope it's an interesting question julie because it's it's sort of a bit of a mixed bag there's some people, some of the visitors saying, do not let anybody near the place. I don't want my parent or my loved one put at risk. Stop, close the doors, don't let them in. We're at home, we're isolated. We're over 70 ourselves, especially of the, of the um, hundred year olds or, or any of the centenarians. And then there are others who, who just feel like they, you know, there's, as, as Melissa said, there's the dignity of risk and they want to be able to come in and see their parent. So it's a very careful balance for us, also taking into account that we have 1,200 staff. So, you know, their, their well-being, their family's well-being, the parents at home, the people they live with, um, their little children also have to be taken into account throughout the process. So we've really had to keep the balance as best we can whilst being under the guidelines of the public health unit, the government guidelines, the visitation guidelines, and it has been quite a difficult balancing act to keep everybody happy with the outcome. And Melanie, uh, before I come to Alan for a, a final question, um, how, what have you been able to do to assist your residents? Now, I know your residents' capacity is extremely varied, but I mean, you have many people who are, are very alert. I, I mean, I, I, okay. so how are you helping the residents? So that's been an interesting um, thing as well, which M Melissa also touched on. Um, at Monty, we employ all of our own allied health team, which is quite unusual for aged care. So we have in-house physios, OT, speech therapists, dance, music, um, you name it, we have them. Mass You've even got a dental room, haven't you? We've got a dental clinic. So we have in-house all of our, our fabulous allied health team. What we've done is we've repurposed our staff. So whereas we used to have perhaps a group exercise class, we're more likely to be doing one-on-ones. We've repurposed our spiritual team. We've repurposed our volunteer coordinators because the volunteers are out at the moment. And so we have a much greater staff balance on the floor. And those people are able to do one-on-ones of very meaningful activities. Also Zooming, connecting with families and sitting in on those conversations and being able to interact afterwards and debrief the residents once they've had the conversation. One more thing though, Julie, just to say, the residents are not as distressed often as the families on the outside. They have a full life. Interestingly, many of our residents are Holocaust survivors. So you'd think having been incarcerated previously in their lives, this might be a trigger for them. And I can truly say that they actually aren't minding it as much as those people in the community at home. That's a very interesting comment. Melissa, I just have to get a quick comment from you on uh, economics of aged care, whether it be support at home or uh, in residential aged care, because money matters, doesn't it? And, and we've had brief reference by Professor Bryant to the economic challenges that are going to cause some distress in this crisis. Just a, a quick observation on for people watching who may not be able to afford to come to Monty, but who are, are, are still needing to manage their own aged care or their parents' aged care. So look, absolutely, Julie. And I think, um, you know, un unfortunately, to, to a degree, money does matter um, as you get older. I think all of us, well, I shouldn't say all, that's a broad brush statement, um, but many of us have this wish or this dream to live out our lives a certain way, whether it's in our own homes with a certain amount of care, or if we do need to go into more formal care, whether it is somewhere like Montefiore Randwick, where one of my own grandmothers was, um, whether it's um, a, a model, something like um, a group home style model. Um, at the end of the day, we need to be able to afford it. Um, so I, I have a, a couple of thoughts on this. I think what can be really helpful is having some difficult conversations early 
with your family, with your GP, just to better understand, you know, what are the systems at play? What are my options and how can I fund it? So we are relatively fortunate in the sense that in Australia, um, there are a number of government packages that are available. So for example, if you reach out to an organization called My Aged Care, um, they can sort of walk you through what funding is available and it'll depend on your sort of um, particular financial situation. But you could be entitled to some government funding to support care in the home, um, to help you if you need to transition into residential aged care. People can get up to, I think it's nine weeks of respite, subsidised respite in residential care. Um, and often it's also worth reaching out if, you know, if, if your heart is set on, for example, somewhere like Monty Randwick, um, it's where your friends are, it's where your, your loved ones are, reach out and have a phone call because I've often... Can I just say, Melissa, thank you for that. Absolutely. Um, earlier, Julie, you said, you know, not everyone can, can access Monty. They absolutely can. It's as assessed by the Department of Health and our commitment is to uh, providing care to everyone in the community. More than 40% of our residents are fully subsidised. So that is they pay 85% of their Australian pension and nothing more. So we do, we are able to provide that. And you're quite right, Melissa. It's just a matter of reaching out. Uh, my apologies, Melanie. I just, I, you know, as someone who's eaten in the dining room and attended the music and done very, I have to admit, I assumed it may be expensive. So, no, no. no thank you. That's a very important piece of information. So thank you. Um, Alan, I've been an absolute devil, I know, and I've gone on too long, but is there a, a question that we must answer or someone will explode? Uh, well, one of the questions that people keep asking, what are the support services? But I'd just like to say that at the end of this um, event and through the email that we've connected you with, there will be a full list of all available, that we are aware of available services, including Monty, COA, Jewish Care, etc. So that's one thing. The second one is, okay, we're all self-indulgent about restructuring and creating routines for ourselves, but what about the feelings of being productive and useful again? I mean, that's what's happened. We sort of have had to be less productive in some ways and feeling of being less useful. So I don't know how Richard and Henry think about that, the older person, when they've already been very productive and now they're getting older, although I work with Henry, we're not getting older yet, I'm 70. So I think that we have to look at um, how we can be more productive and useful when everything around us suddenly is not being that, that way inclined. Uh, Henry, could I have a final comment from, from you on that question? And we, we, there was the mention of uh, the, the volunteers. I mean, many of us do a lot of volunteer work and we're not necessarily being able to do that. It's such an important source of meaning in later life. So, yeah, meaning is important. We all need to be feel, 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 feel fulfilled and uh, feel that we're contributing in some way. And it can be through volunteering. A lot of grandparents do a lot of child duties, which make them feel good as well. Um, and um, it may be self things you do for yourself, like learning something or attending some sort of course. And can I just mention one thing, if I get, I've got the chance, is there's something called Computer Pals for Seniors. And this is for people who want to learn how to use a computer. Computer Pals for Seniors is, operates in many suburbs, and there's a branch in Bondi Junction. So if people want to learn that, they, they can do that through there. Thank you. And also, uh, um, Rachel from COA has left a message that they have a, a Tech Connect program. Uh, so again, I think people like Melissa and Levi are fantastic resources for what would be available uh, within the region that many of you would be in. Uh, I'm a great and, believer in and, speaking... Uh, sorry, Alan? And Monty also provides people with how to use systems and helping people connect on Zoom. I know they've also done that very well. Thanks, Alan. Yep. Yep, thank you. Uh, Richard, I'm about to finish up. Is there a final remark you'd like to make before I hand back to Alan Shell? Look, I think it's been a great bunch of questions and a lot of great comments. I, I'd reiterate the last points that were made about meaning. Um, I think it's absolutely pivotal and let's not get sucked into the idea that because so much has been limited and restricted on our lives, that it's all gone. There's always more we can do. We've just got to explore find new things we've never done before, find things in ourselves, push the boundaries. 
And it's actually a great time of creativity. Um, and I think the other thing I'd really push is if you want to have meaning, always help. We can always reach out and help other people. You know, just basic compassion for others. There's a lot of meaning in that. Um, so I'd, I'd really encourage that a lot too. Thank you. And Henry, you started getting excited. Then what excited you? What Richard was saying. <laughs> yes, exactly. There is meaning is, is important. There's so much we can do. And the whole point about being creative and thinking about what else to do. And if it's not you, if it's your older parent or grandparent you're supporting, work with them. Their life story. Sit down with them. Start, start doing that. I mean, these stories will be lost. Creating a montage of photographs or a video record of a person's life. Yes, yes, yes. Let's all get excited. Uh, well, obviously, in, in the Jewish community, so good at that. Uh, yes, uh, but this, yes. if you haven't done it yet, this is the yes. time. Look, I'd just like to say thank you so much for having me tonight. And I'd like to hand back to my friend, Dr. Alan Schell, to, to close proceedings. But thank you to all our panel, which Alan will do. But this is, uh, for those of you who didn't hear earlier, this is clapping in signing language for the deaf. Uh, thanks very much, Julie. And I think we've got another poll question, which is a big one, because we'd like to know, um, do you prefer Zoom over face-to-face -face type of in-person at event cinema? So if I just asked Jackson to put up the poll, uh, and then we'll, we'll collect that information, and uh, we'll then be able to get back to you in due course with our future events. And with that, I have to say thank you very much personally to our wonderful Guests tonight, Melissa Levy, Professor Richard Bind, Professor Henry Bedati, our guest, Ali Limburg, and also to Rachel Tanney from COA. Uh, we have many great outreach support services in the community. We will provide that list um, with the email back to you after the event. We do have a survey that we do ask you to please uh, fill in for us because we'd like to provide you with equally good events in the future. And we do them at least five times a year. This year has been a few more. Uh, and I think that your feedback is most important, uh, what can I say, and uh, we've enjoyed having you. We've had well over 140 people that registered. We know that's close to probably 200 because there'll be other people in the house, so that's fantastic. And I can really only say thank you very much to Julie and thank you all for a really great evening. And everybody stay well, and hopefully we will have a vaccine soon so we can see our grandchildren and the rest of us in a bit of more of a peace of mind. So thank you, good night, and please stay well. And uh, we will now conclude this webinar. Yes, thank you. Thanks, Julie.